What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Behind the Facade. You will probably notice from my voice that it's a little bit hoarse, and that is because I'm uh, 24 hours out since my wedding and off on my honeymoon tomorrow. So I'm recording this episode uh, quickly in the hope that just I'd like to put a podcast out while I'm away, and uh, I'm going to hope that this scheduling uh, with Libsyn that I mentioned before works perfectly fine and that you guys will be listening to this uh, next week. Now, my guest this week is a little bit different to the usual uh, guests, and I wanted to do something a little bit different given that it is my, uh, since I'm away and on my honeymoon and stuff, and I'm t speaking with a man called Mark Bryant. Now, Mark is an interesting chap in so far as he has this incredible story and I'm going to let him tell his story rather than kind of ruin the surprise but Mark's story brings us through um, he went through this kind of very very stressful period in his life and he's managed to deal with it and what I wanted the the lesson for you guys to learn from from doing this is just that you know at the moment, with all this market madness, you know, crypto is, you know, fluctuating so wildly. The stock market, particularly the tech sector, is massively down. Um, there's now started, they're starting to talk about, you know, interest rates rising and affecting the property markets and all this. So, and there's a lot of talk about recession and all this kind of stuff. So, the, the economic outlook is not as clear as it has been for the last couple of years. And um, that being the case, I think a lot of people are kind of feeling stress and getting a bit concerned. And whether that's right or wrong is another thing. But what I want is for you guys to bring some different perspectives to uh, from this. I think you'll gain them from this conversation. And uh, you'll understand what I mean when you get into this uh, interview with Mark. Now, um, I'm not going to go into any more detail on, than that. This is a good interview. I think you'll get a lot from it, particularly if you're health focused like me. And uh, and so and Mark, by the way, has a, a an experience like built up his business to 12 million in revenue. So this is not a uh, this this is not an on you know a non business related podcast. This but this particular episode has something that's slightly different to the usual. So I hope you're going to enjoy my conversation with, with Mark Bryant. You are listening to Behind the Facade, and I'm your host, Gavin J. Gallagher. On this podcast, I explore the mental and emotional game often playing out subconsciously, both in your mind and the mind of everyone else in the real estate or property investment market. The key to success in this game is to master your mindset and behavior, to take control of your thoughts, your emotions, and most importantly, your ego. Welcome to the show. Mark Bryant, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for inviting me on here, Gavin. It's great to have you on, uh, Mark. Now, first of all, the first question is always like, where in the world are you as we, as we speak at this very minute? I am in a place called Roson Sea in North Wales. Um, so not just on the just on the edge of Snowdonia, um, nice. but quite close to the sea as well. Five minutes walk. Oh, nice! Yeah, very nice. Well, we're going to get into your story today, and uh, as I'm going to, I'll be introducing you sort of separately. And uh, but we want a little bit of your backstory. I mean, this is a real estate podcast, as I mentioned, and so you own a couple of properties, and you have um, you've come from the the plumbing and heating industry, and mm. uh, let, like. Obviously, there's a much bigger story here that we're going to talk about shortly. But can you just tell us, you know, give us a little bit of backstory before the changes that took place in your life? Like, yeah, what? So, tell us about, you know, starting out and, and getting into what, uh, this, you know, the, the the real estate industry or the property industry initially. Um, I left uni in 19, 2000. I was a fresher of 96 down in Exeter. And um, I never applied for jobs. Um, I got all the application forms to become a management consultant. I liked the idea of that. I did general engineering and management at university. So I, I liked sort of the broader aspect of how things worked. Um, and my dad was moving back from the Middle East. And so he brought into a franchise. He was an electrician by trade before he went off into the oil and gas industry. Um, and we grew up over there. 
it's in Qatar. And uh, anyway, so down in Exeter, um, my dad was just launching his region of this franchise that specialised in gas and electrical safety inspections for landlords. Um, so I said that I'd come and help him run it. I never applied for any of the management consultancy jobs. So fast forward, I think 12 or 15 years later, I was running a company um, that specialised in edu energy efficiency. So we did cavity wall insulation, loft insulation, external wall insulation, and we had a couple hundred people working for us, 12 million turnover. Wow, big, big um, business, yeah. Yeah, and so I'd really sort of um, evolved myself in that sector, but as a contractor, not as a property developer. Um, albeit I did have a few of my own properties, but I was so busy in work, I never had the time to grow my own property portfolio any more than they just being properties that ended up in our portfolio because we moved house and we kept the old one. I get so you. property by default. So we still have um, some of those properties that are now holiday lets. So there's a bit more of an established business around the property. But in June 2015, this stress full life turned into chronic back pain. And it only lasted, it, 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 the onset was a couple of weeks. I was getting really tired. I was launching a new division of the company. Um, specializing in private sales because a lot of our work was contracting energy companies, giving us funding, and then we go out and deliver funded energy efficiency contracts gotcha. um, or products to um, residential um, homeowners and tenants. So uh, this back pain got progressively worse. And I'd been to the children's sports day um, and my wife and I were in this kitchen here and she was like, do not go to the training, stay here. Um, you're, you're knackered. I was like, no, I've got to go. So I left my house, drove up to Yorkshire, which is about two and a half hours away. And on the way, I stopped to the A&E in North Wales, accident and emergency saying, how long's the wait? Because I wanted stronger painkillers. It was that bad. Wow. And so by the time I got to Yorkshire, um, got into the hotel room I was googling for a chiropractor 24-hour chiropractor and I couldn't find one even though they said they were they weren't I was really annoyed with the ones that had mobile numbers and they never phoned me back and uh, I went downstairs to the receptionist and I said um mate can you phone me an ambulance I'm in in absolute agony like it was in my ribs it was it was horrendous 15 minutes later I went I said have you phoned the ambulance no um, I phoned the NHS helpline and they're going to phone you in a minute. I was like, Pah. so I phoned the ambulance myself and um, literally within minutes they came, gas and air. And so I went to hospital in my mind going, I'll get back to deliver the training the next day. Like that's how, you know, I've done an all nighter before. Yeah, um, yeah. I can do this. And this is like the mindset of never giving up, you know? Um, and so I got to the hospital and I asked the, the nurse what the cascade of meds was to the strongest painkiller, which was morphine. And so he gave me the stepping, the pathway, and they took my bloods. I was like, why are you taking my bloods? Like, I've got back pain. I just need to see a chiropractor or someone. Um, anyway, fast forward about four hours later, and it was getting worse by this time. And I said, look, I'm going to have to just give in and cancel the training. Um, and then the doctor came over and said, look, we're going to have to keep you in overnight anyway, because we're not happy with your blood. And that got my brain thinking, what the hell could it be? Yeah. When my mum was in the hospital three years previous, she went in and then two weeks later, she died wow. having had small cell lung cancer. So these alarm bells started to go off um, and I decided to take the morphine. And luckily the pain had subsided. And I remember being wheeled from the, the A&E section up to the main, um, one of the main wards. And the next morning I was told I had a leukemia. Jeez, wow. And so the spinning hamster wheel that was running at hundred miles an hour that we, that we are, that I was so good at creating for myself suddenly came off and it was like nothing else matters. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. So, and leukemia, just for people who don't understand or don't know the kind of ins and outs of, of cancer and stuff like that, like explain what leukemia is. With cancer, there are so many different types of cancer. Leukemia is specifically a blood cancer. 
acute leukemia, which I had, is fast acting. So if you'd have tested me a month before, it would unlikely have shown up in my blood. Wow. Whereas some, yeah. yeah. So you know, my mum, but these these things don't just spring out of nowhere. There would have been other symptoms. However, now I know. Um, but uh, so you've got um, chronic illness and you've got acute illnesses. Acute are the ones that are more um, faster onset and chronic is more of a slower onset. So a a tumor doesn't just appear out of nowhere. It will appear over time. And only when you see, when you get discomfort, you go for a test. This could be a few years, years and years after the original um, issue started to be, to manifest itself, you know? So, so cancers can be tumorous, hard, um, and equally they can be a blood cancer as well. And mine was a, um, a blood cancer of which there are many different types and flavors. Wow. <laughs> and so, I mean, explain your, you know, just for in that moment, like when he said the word leukemia, you know, what, what's going through your mind? Peace. You know, peace as in you, you know, what's, uh, you at least know what the problem is. Um, nothing, you know, like it was just an empty space of, okay, how do we resolve this? You know, like that's, that's my mindset. Like I didn't go into panic i didn't go into panic you know that wasn't i didn't cry i didn't break down i didn't like some people will just freeze in fear the first thing i said was okay how do we solve this and and what was the response from i mean because sometimes when you when someone says how do you solve this a doctor might think this guy doesn't get it you know it's you know this is not like a couple of pills and you'll be back on your feet you know this is a serious thing i've always had like an entrepreneurial mindset you know and i think you know, the more I've learned, I now specialize in helping people um, develop resilience and well-being in the workplace. And so when I gone through my training as a master practitioner and facilitator, one of the key drivers of, um, of resilience is flexible thinking, solutions right. mindset versus fixed mindset. And so uh, because I've been um, privy to spending a lot of time on self-development in the years leading up to my illness, I was always of the solutions mindset. Like, well, why can't we do it? Well, how do we get, you know, possibility thinking? Like, how, how do we solve the problem? Do I have to go down this path? Do I have to take this medication? Do I have to take this treatment? What else is there? Can right, I not right. do this naturally? I like the with the question. I was a pain in the ass when it came <laughs> to patient, you know, because I'm questioning everything. Right, like, right. W- why do we have to do this? You know, I'd already had an inkling that modern medicine was toxic, um, invasive, and can, you know, sometimes, and, uh, you know, y- you can use a sledgehammer to crack a nut, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so that, uh, my, my first questioning was, how do I not have the stem cell transplant, which I later, you know, which I had a few months later? Um, and so all my family, and you know, the peer pressure, is like you you have to do it you can't you like you have to do the treatment and but all my research was looking at how can i not have it yeah yeah um, get you. because the treatment in itself was 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 the most toxic cancer treatment exposed to humans right wow intense chemotherapy and four days of full body radiotherapy and so i mean just taking us back for a moment the at the time that this was diagnosed did your did you have fam, uh, children or anything like that or what was I your did. situation amber was uh seven she was born in 2008 and ella was five yeah <laughs> it's funny my daughter is amber she was born in 2004 so <laughs> there you go uh it's interesting the i mean from the point of view of you know you're dealing with this and you've got these youngsters at home i mean how how did you kind of bring how did you notify your wife first of all that this is what you're kind of uh, facing because i did i didn't tell anybody oh wow okay so tell us so, more how you were dealing with this entirely kind of in your like but at some stage you had to let her know I was in the accident and emergency in uh, Barnsley. So I was in the, on the main ward and um, I phoned my best friend who worked for me at the time as a regional manager. So I, I told him to come to the hospital first. I said, don't tell anybody else. And the people that were coming to the training, I text in the morning, five o'clock. And I said, 
don't leave North Wales, just turn up. Um, sorry, don't leave North Wales, just stay there. I've canceled the training. I'll let you know what happened later. So I created a safe container for me to just solve this challenge. Um, and so it wasn't like I had had, you know, like typically men don't like to, you know, oh, I've got a health issue and I'm not going to go to the doctors. It wasn't like I'd had a health issues for months leading up to it. It was literally just back pain onset two, three weeks, you know? Wow. Um, yeah. So quick. It's insane. And so I invited Roy in, he came in and had a, uh, he was there when the doctor came in and gave me a diagnosis. And when we knew what the situation was, it wasn't just back pain. I was then right. What's the best strategy to deal with this now? So my, I, Roy phoned my brother and my dad both worked for me. Um, and they, they were sorting the logistics. My car was up here and Roy, Roy's an operations guy, right? So he's just like solving all the technical issues of uh, how do we get the car back? And my brother was, who's he, he was my transplant recipient. I received his stem cells. Okay, wow. So, uh, so I'm not quite sure how he found out, but um, my, one of my other friends, Roy, Rodri, he, he was told by Roy and said, right, do me a favor and go and pick Fiona up and bring her up to the hospital. And so, but do not tell Fiona what's happened. <laughs> so she was on her way up. Rod, Rod, Rodri knew what was going on. So I don't know how he kept his mouth shut all the way up there. Yeah, I imagine. <laughs> okay. um, just my, Rodri was passing my sister and my sister had just been told because we live relatively close. And Emma had to pull the car over and she was crying. And Fiona was like, what's wrong with Emma? <laughs> And uh, anyway, so it must have been he, scary for your wife, like with this stuff kind of happening. That there's there's something serious going on. Like you can ask her in a minute. <laughs> so anyway, so she, so my, when my dad came in, he didn't know. He just got told to come to the hospital. And I said, I'm sorry. You know, like I felt like I'd failed. Like wow. I got I got ill. You know, there's a lot in that feeling when we talk about emotional well being. And uh, so when Fiona came again, I was I was I had guilt and shame, like I I made it I fucked up. Excuse my French. And um, and they and so she, so she was told. But by that time, I was in pain. I was in morphine. So maybe the magnitude of the problem I was trying to solve was kind of clouded a little bit with the morphine that yeah. had been taken. Does that mean yeah? Yeah, no, it makes sense. My 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 father died back um, when I was in my twenties, and he was only forty five years of age. But he, in the last couple of days, he was on heavy doses of morphine, and like you know, he he was out of it in in a big way. You know, so I'm sure. I had, yeah, by that time I was on Oromol. So um, so we got me in the car, and then we came back to North Wales, and then the whole the whole treatment process unraveled from there, really. And just, uh, just as a curiosity, I mean, why does that turn, like, why is the, uh, why is the back pain the, the cause uh, of, of leukemia? I don't understand how it links. Is it connected in some way? You'd be certain, like, I've, lots of cancer patients I've spoken to, like the symptoms that show up are just symptoms that we would think were every day, but then when it's dug a bit deeper, um it then transpires that they've got some kind of cancer um so for me the back pain because it was acute lymphoblastic leukemia it's where the the stem cells start to multiply right the, the bad stem cells start to multiply so my bone marrow if you imagine inside the bone was just completely compact like under pressure with okay. blood cells so I was aching from inside the bone, not muscular. Wow. And that's why, because where we produce a lot of the stem cells, which ultimately make our immune system, um, we've got a lot in our chest, we've got in our hips and our backs. Um, and that's where the stem cells um, create our health and wow. our immune system. Yeah. So that's so why it was hurting inside the bones. I thought it was, it was kind of like back pain. But yeah actually bone pressure right because I, i've i've suffered from back pain many years ago and like the lower disc and all that kind of yeah. stuff the the like what's it called the slipped disc 
and uh, and it was really debilitating for a while and then after a while it, it i basically started training and, and it's why i got into triathlon actually mm. was because the fitter i got and the healthier i got kind of the better my back pain uh, my, my back pain just kind of disappeared i guess my core and my muscles and all that kind of stuff started to support the back or whatever you know yeah i my i completely agree with physical fitness is is a is a good pillar of um of overall health massively so yeah i still get lower back pain sometimes and i'm like mm, mm, what's that yeah what's that? yeah because uh, i too have suffered with lower back pain in my life um, right okay. so it, it's it's uh and then i've had 20 bone marrow biopsies over the last six years so uh and you think why is that well <laughs> Just yeah, feed yeah. into it. No, I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mark, I just, I mean, I'm thinking now, um, take us forward because, mm-hmm. you know, finding out is one thing, dealing with it is another. And, I mean, you, you were telling me about this sort of previously and the fact that the prognosis was not good. So tell us, you know, what happened next. It, um, I tried not to ask the prognosis when I first got ill. Um, I'd heard stories from my personal development space that, you know, um, Joseph McClendon, one of Tony Robbins trainers, he, he tells a story about his mother and he was racing across America to get to his mom to make sure the doctors didn't tell her the prognosis because they were going to help her laugh her and use humor and use sort of well-being to help her recover from her illness. Um, so it was that story that stuck in my mind. Um, and so I, I refrained from asking the prognosis until I got to the radiologist and I was like, what's the prognosis through this? And he was like, well, it's 50, 50, just with the radiotherapy, let alone the treatment. So I was like, okay, I've got enough information. (laughs) You don't want Um, to beyond that. (laughs) I didn't need to know any more than that. So, um, so that was kind of the, the, the thinking I had going into the treatment, um, and then six months after I had the stem cell transplant, I had the stem cells on the 17th of September of 2015. So it's a very tight treatment phase, three months of strong chemo, increasingly dosed chemotherapy, four days of full body radiotherapy. You essentially killing the human to the edge of life. Wow. And then you introduced the new stem cells. They find their way to the bone marrow. They start to recreate the immune system and then you come to life again. So I was in a positive pressure room for three weeks um, to make sure there was no bugs or viruses. I wasn't allowed to see anybody other than a few people could come in with their masks on, um, et cetera. And and then I was allowed to go home. And then six months after that, I had the relapse. Right. Okay. So you went through a whole relapse and everything. Yeah. So then I said to my oncologist, don't tell me the revised prognosis. I just want to get well. So I just focused on getting well. And to that point, I'd done a lot of research to not have the treatment. Yeah. So I'd gone down macrobiotic path. I'd juicing the power of alkalinity, raw food sprouting. And there was not one path that I could see that was going to help me. Gerson therapy, um, I phoned the therapy center and they said, oh, we don't help people with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. I was like, so every path I was going down um, never really gave me enough confidence. I found one person because, you know, when you're looking for possibility, you're looking for evidence to support your thinking. So I found one lady that had used a macrobiotic lifestyle to overcome my illness. But that wasn't enough for me to say, hey, I tell you what, I'm not going to do your treatment. I'm just going to rebuild my immune system yeah yeah and so um so relapse tuesday april 2007 16 i said um don't tell me the right prognosis three four days later i saw a naturopath so it was just somebody else that came into my world and it was he that got me off the fence thinking perhaps the disease was just one of those things so anything i was doing in the wake of modern medicine was in the wake of modern medicine. Like it was, perhaps I was doing it futilely. Mm. Like I was doing it because I thought it was good, but I didn't think it was good. Yeah, does that make sense? Like, yeah. yeah? And then the plow of the placebo. And then when I saw the naturopath, he invited me into his office. 
He did a bioresonance scan. He showed me evidence to support certain factors that induce or um, create cancer in or leukemia in in humans. So things like viruses, um, um, telephone masts, where you've got telephone masts, EMF telephone masts, oh, where there are yeah. cancer clusters. You know, everybody's going mad about five G, etc. Yeah. And so then I was thinking, well, look, if something outside of me helped create this disease or my lifestyle helped create this disease, maybe I can influence my immune recovery and rebuild my immune system. So I was bought into his protocol. Like, even though I was doing a lot of the protocol before, I was bought in even more. Like, I was like, well, the cards are stacked against me. And I just went all in on his strategy, which was raw vegan um juicing two liters of juice today enemas etc detoxifying the body saunas skin brushing <laughs> rebounding all the you know lifestyle interventions that you can do um and then i heard about hippocrates which was a health institute in florida um and i was right. like i just want to go there for three weeks called the life transformation program and i got to go there in the october 16 that year so wow. um yeah so that so i think that that was a huge pivot point is where i became more empowered in my healing journey and i think it, it's probably one of the most important points the sooner you be you can become empowered in your healing journey that is the you know it's a bit like a business person running a business like as soon as you get it you're like okay that's where we're going like I i'm in yeah, yeah. i'm all on board you're all coming with me let's freaking go like the energy and the direction um and i think yeah i i was just i felt empowered i i knew i was heading in the right path brilliant and 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 like during this entire period of your recovery and stuff like that did you have any like what had you done in your business i mean your work related and stuff like that um I didn't really want to be in that sector. Didn't really want to be in business um, with that particular business partner at the time. I, you know, I'd done 12 years with him. Um, I started to understand that perhaps some of his strategies weren't in alignment with my values. And I was ready for the out anyway. So earlier that year before I got ill, um, I just put pressure on pressure. I said, I want to buy you out, but I'm not sure how. What I should have said is I want out and I'm going now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, but because I had this overwhelming sense of responsibility for people, for a lot of my family that were working there. Of course. Just pressure on pressure. I want to do the right thing by my business partner. Like this is all emotional unraveling that, later on i can see that that was part of the problem that helped create the disease in the first place too much stress so, yeah oh, massive stress so i left um I, I didn't go back to work from march 2016 like as soon as i heard about the relapse i was like i'm not going back um i officially left in october 7 the 16 um officially resigned left the company the month before that, I'd claim my life insurance because I hit a bit of a rocky bump on my healing journey. Um, and I got some side effects from more of my brother's cells. I had a second infusion. And um, and so I was feeling man down. I had graft versus host. And I was like, I'm not, I'm going to leave. I don't have any income. I've got a mortgage still. Like, Yeah, I was just wondering, like, I mean, all of this treatment as well is, is not cheap. Uh... I mean, and then on top of that, you've got your income has stopped. So, mm -hmm. so you were able to claim your life insurance. Uh, obviously, there's a section of the policy that says terminal. The event. <laughs> yeah. So if you consider terminal, which has to be signed off by your primary physician. So I'd, I was lying on my sofa. I'd had the, my home valued, two local properties valued that day and i was lying there going like i don't know what to do i'm a dad i can't work i'm useless <laughs> i feel i'm a male um 
And I thought, maybe my impolicies cover me for something other than death. I didn't have critical illness because it was more expensive than life cover. Yeah. I, I, but three policies I had covered me for terminal illness. So I was like, wicked. <laughs> <laughs> so I then had to wait a whole week for my oncologist to come back from holiday in Mallorca. And I emailed him and said, look, can you phone me about my insurance? I'd already spoken to next door neighbors who were doctors, everyone else that I could find. They can't tell me whether I was considered terminal or not. Only he could. So he phones me. He's like, hi, Adrian. Like, hi, Mark. You want me to write you off? I was like, yeah, I think so. And, um, and that and must so, be a, yeah, that's crazy. I mean, like for you to access your <laughs> life insurance, you have to get your doctor to, to basically write write you off and say that you're terminal and that you know there's no recovery from this so in a sense that that whole mindset that's got to be playing in your mind as well a little bit is it i i was i had one intention like i had graft versus host i knew what it was yes it can be debilitating for some people that have had a stem cell transplant or an organ transplant for that matter a graft versus host can be a um a graft versus host issue so the donor's cells attacking the recipient cells, yeah? And that's what happened to me. And luckily, I'd, I'd overcome that. I'd had some steroids. I'd taken myself into hospital because I felt so low. Um, and so as soon as I overcame that speed bump, I just was on this lifestyle mission. Like I was raw vegan, eating 50% living foods. I had a cultivator in my garage. I was going to teach the world about raw and living foods. Um, and I wanted to go to Florida where one of my mentors lived, Tony Robbins. Um, and I wanted to go to this health institute for three weeks. And that was always on my mind. And you know, when you've got something and that was like, that's, that's happening. I don't care what yeah. gets in my pack. Like a dog with a bone, basically. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I want to go there. I want to experience it. I want to learn it. And why the hell don't more people know about this stuff now? You know? So, and I'd met the guy that runs the Institute a few times during the summer because he came to travel in the UK. Um, and again, some of these people are a bit like Marmite. Some people think it's quackery. Some people think it's the best thing since sliced, sliced bread and so you got to choose which path you 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 go down and I was all in because I didn't have much else <laughs> anywhere yeah. else I was like yeah I'm, I'm on it so um so yeah I claimed my own life insurance it was relatively swift phoned them up hello I'm considered terminal um oh that's terrible really compassionate really understanding we just need to go through a few simple forms with you and then we'll contact your consultant Within four weeks, I got paid out um, one and a half million pounds. And then I flew to America and um, for the first time. And it was, it was amazing. It was transformational. Like the, you started to get to the root of why I got ill in the first place. I didn't get ill because I worked in particularly toxic environment, as in environmentally toxic, right, you know, right. um, exposed to chemicals or pesticides i wasn't i didn't think i was i didn't live next to any telephone masks because i'd already had somebody come and check all that out so then you start to peel the layers and go well what else could it be and um emotional stress i think for me was one of the biggest ones and so you start i'd never had psychotherapy for that first session when i walked in um and had my first session and he he was uh, andrew andy his name is and he was like you don't get angry i was like no, <laughs> I mean, you know, no, I don't get angry. He's like, well, you know, and then you start to unpick some of the emotional um, things that we've stored in our suitcases, you know, or in our shadow or the wounded inner child or whatever you want to call it. But we start to unpick some of the emotional trauma that has kept us blocked energetically mm. and i think energetically blocked emotion is this ease in the body and for me it was like a pressure cooker waiting to go off um so yeah so the the emotional trauma so that 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 started that whole transformation and then i came back to england and i was like right i'm going to teach this and i launched a thing called the energize academy 
um, and I started teaching workshops around raw food because I wasn't quite there teaching people about the mindset that it takes to overcome tragedy or difficult situations. But fast right. forward to now, I feel confident that I can speak into that um, from an emotional and spiritual perspective as well. Yeah. Wow. And um, I mean, I, I can see the hat that you're wearing, terminal to triathlon, and that's what what I first noticed back when uh, when we started speaking. Um, tell us about you know the the mission that you have with that one. Um, with terminal to triathlon, I, in my hospital room when I had the stem cell transplant, I drew a mind map on my magic white paper. So I um, and I, along there was like. You know, one of my projects was to do an Ironman because when I was 14 in school, um, I entered the school triathlon and I won it against all the six formers as well because I was a bit better at swimming than all them. So I got out minutes and minutes ahead of anybody that could run or swim. And, um, and so I got crowned the Ironman in school, but it wasn't an Ironman distance by any stretch. So <laughs> there's always been a, 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 uh, it was a proud moment in front of all the six form girls. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, um, so, so yeah, so I, I've done a sprint distance. When I came back from America, I ended up going to America and having immunotherapy treatment over there. Um, and I came back in 2018 and I did my first triathlon, which was just a sprint distance. And then last year I did equivalent of a half Ironman. And then right. this year, is the crescendo, which is where we go and do full. a full Ironman in Cork. Yeah, yeah, here in Ireland, that's great. And uh, I'm signed up, as I mentioned, although we'll have to wait and see, does that, uh, does that all transpire? Um, I mean, in terms of just some of the, the learnings from your, your whole kind of experience, Mark, like take us through, uh, you know, lifestyle choices and mindset hacks that you've kind of developed over the last couple of years. Just anything that you think would be, helpful to anybody uh, as opposed to somebody who's dealing with such a kind of a, a terminal kind of health crisis um for there's two things okay number one is like what i call the foundations in terms of physical energy like how do we maintain it because i put on my little preview that i filled out on the form for the podcast um is called the feeling fresh formula. Like health is not rocket science, okay? And so when you look at high performance, so most entrepreneurs don't see themselves as a high performer. They just see themselves as an entrepreneur um, that might be amongst the ocean of entrepreneurs. Like in the UK, we've got something like 6 million SMEs. Yeah. Only 4.5% of them have over nine employees. And so to get in the top 5% of any world sporting endeavors to be on the world stage, you need to be a high performer. Like, so to, to translate that into entrepreneurial endeavors, like what does it take to be in the top 5% in terms of business success or business growth? It takes a certain caliber and approach to that, to that project. Like for me, I spent 10 years trying to work it out for myself. I didn't do any self-development. I thought I had the right mentor. I, unfortunately, I got it wrong. And it was only when I started self-development that I started to, like the, the jigsaw pieces started to drop into place of what it takes to be a great leader, to be a great business person. So when it comes to cancer, most people will live the experience of the mainstream narrative around health, well-being, and cancer recovery. But those few that think that I'm not gonna do it like everyone else, I'm gonna use the best of what that, that the modern medicine has to offer, but I'm also gonna optimize it with everything I can do to help me recover and overcome illness. Like you have to have a certain level of thinking, strategic thinking to analyze the problem um, unemotionally and think objectively about it and then make the best plan for you. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So when it comes to high performance, there's three pillars, um, physical energy, emotional energy, and environmental energy. So 
the physical energy is what I call the feeling fresh formula. So if anybody's got a pen, I didn't mean to teach on this. <laughs> Go on, tell the us. The feeling yeah. fresh formula is food. Like, how do we get fabulous foods? Um, yes, you know, when it comes to spectrums of food, yes, you can eat a lot of living foods, raw foods, whole foods. Like the number of people that are eating processed crap junk or think that being vegan because they're eating vegan food. But when you look at the packaging on vegan products, it's got so many additives. I don't even touch that stuff. So my, my strategy when it comes to food is just whole foods. I, I do eat meat now. I do eat some fish. It's usually wild. I try not to eat farm stuff unless I really know um, where it's come from. Uh, so food, fabulous food. Um, and so whole where possible and practical. Um, rest is the second one. FR, restorative rest. E is essential exercise and elimination. Like we live in a toxic world. So elimination is about, we've got, I don't know, two, three times as much lymph as we have blood. So things like body brushing, like I've got a lot of lactic acid buildup in my body at the minute because of training. So body brushing, tongue scraping, breathing through our nose as opposed to our mouth, um, having saunas, cold is that, dipping. Is that is that effective? Yeah, I, I've never considered <laughs> body brushing and stuff like that. Yeah, like in terms of lymphatic system is helping the lymph drain. Like you can get it from doing exercise and running and jogging. Um, but lymph brushing, body brushing is a big, massive thing that Tony talks about in Life and Wealth Mastery. Right, right. Um, Interesting. Must look into that. So exercise and elimination. It's a nice morning primer before you have a cold shower. Yeah, yeah. yeah? Cold shower as well, yeah. <laughs> well, I don't do it every day. Um, but cold is good. I like the cold. Um, exercise elimination. S, uh, F, R, E, uh, we talked about. S is supplementation and structure. So how do we create clear boundaries um, for ourselves? So structure around time, structure around day, um, creating clear boundaries, not just with our time, but also with people. And then the final one, H, is hydration. Oh, yeah, hydration. Hygienic hydration um, in terms of nice filtered water, etc. cetera. Um, Mark, I'm just looking at the time. In terms of advice, uh, I mean, we're, first of all, we're seven years on now since your first kind of diagnosis and stuff. Are you getting regular, like, tests? I mean, I guess you're going back and getting checked and stuff like that on a regular basis. So from that point of view... Yeah, there's always the the concern, I suppose, that this thing will come back and like make a reappearance or something like that. Does that 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 obviously changes your out, your outlook on the future and stuff like that? Does it? It it does. Um, so in my situation, it's a fast acting cancer. If it did come back, um, I've just had a year and a half of all clears, and my most recent bone marrow biopsy came back with. Um, a really annoying reading, which is POQR. So positive on the outer quantitative range, which means we can see the disease marker, but we can't quantify it. Right. Because if we can quantify it, then that's not good news. Let's get some heavy artillery in here and let's go and, you know. Blast it, um, yeah. Yeah. So when I had a POQR going back to 2017, so 2016, claimed my life insurance, went to America came back, I was going to set the world on fire with raw foods. Um, ran my first workshop in January 17, POQR came up on the reading. Oncologist in England said, hey, look, I think we should have some more treatment. I was like, well, we've done so well to get me this far. Does it not make sense to focus on rebuilding my immune system? Um, and his opinion was, no, either do nothing or have this one month on chemotherapy in hospital, 24 hours a day on a drip. And I was like, so they were my two options. And I met a uh, hematology oncologist in America that had a practice, an immunotherapy clinic, Maharaj Regenerative Medicine Clinic in Boca Raton near West Palm Beach. So I had a consultation with him and he said, come over here and have immunotherapy. That was 100,000 to go there. Wow. 
And so he shared with me what his plan was. And then my doctor in England was like, I think it's quackery. And if you do go, you're wasting your kid's inheritance. So that decision making process, like one thing I would say is sometimes you need to be an indecision and just be OK with it. Like, yeah, I I know this is really stressful and I haven't made the decision yet. And I'm OK to sit in indecision for now. Right. Well, um, yeah, that's good advice. Yeah. Yeah. So so I had three months, three bone marrow biopsies um, and it was POQR, POQR, POQR. <laughs> <laughs> So I made the decision. I said, right, I'm going to go. So I launched a GoFundMe campaign um, because, you know, I didn't want to spend money that was going to be wasting my kids' inheritance. You know, I could have, um, I might have died over there. And I was like, how much did it cost to ship a body back? I couldn't get insurance. It was like, I was like in what I felt like panic. And so I went and I had six weeks of treatment with my oncologist. And he was amazing. Like he added another dimension to my healing which i think is really important for the listeners is that as a business owner you're tracking kpis yeah, yeah? so we've got this the c the cfo looking at you know balance sheet financials income cash we're looking at all the key drivers of performance within the, the workplace and like in our bodies we have all those key metrics that we could measure but mainstream medicine doesn't They'll only look at a problem and then try and fix the problem, but not the root cause of the problem. Yeah. Yeah. So you add functional medicine. So he got there. He was like, right, where's the information coming from in your body? So let's test your immune, um, test your immune system, immune. Um, yeah. Your immune system. He does an immune panel, um, heavy metal testing, microbiome testing, which is your guts. He does micronutrient testing. He did, um, a whole uh, hormonal panel testing. He did a whole load of testing that I've never had. And I was like, why the hell didn't I think of this myself? Like, yeah. how do you fix the system, test the system, look out where there's imbalance is, and then plug the gaps. And so that, that was a game changer. And I was like, so I've added for the last six years functional medicine into my healing strategy, which you have to pay for. It's not something that you can get through you know, maybe in America, you can get some functional proactive healthcare, but not really in the UK. There is a bit in vitality where you get in blood panels and you can start to see how well you are or how ill you are and they're useful. Um, so it's adding functional medicine into um, the practice. And then I came back to England, had a bone marrow. And it was all clear. And my oncologist sent me a, an email and said, great news. What the hell do I know? Great result anyway. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. And I mean, in terms of uh, health strategies for, for, you know, the average person, you mentioned a lot of tests and panels and stuff like that. Is there anything that's worth doing on a regular basis as just a kind of a, a normal person that's got, you know, good health? Um, to work with a functional medicine practitioner, you know, they might charge a couple hundred quid. Um, you'll fill out a questionnaire. You know, if you do have symptoms or you are taking medication, go and work with a functional medicine practitioner. Like good nutritionists can do the same, but functional medicine practitioners are, are good. And then a six or 12 month, month you know, regular checkup, depending on what they suggest. But my ultimate goal is to become a functional medicine practitioner. Okay. Um, there's a doctor I know who uses clinical coaching for workforces. So the company pays for a blood panel. Um, and then there's health tech that feeds lifestyle data back into the mix. And then all of the workforce can get clinical coaching because most people don't freaking change. That's the problem. And it was only through desperation that they go, oh, shit, I need to change. Mm. You know, yeah, um, that's true. So, yeah. And also open, you know, if there is emotional dissonance or they know that there's a, a, a mental health challenge. I said in my little write up to you is like, do the work. Like, don't be scared of doing the work. Like if there is unresolved trauma from the past, embrace the emotional and the spiritual healing work. Yeah. Right. Interesting. So Mark, um, what advice, what's the best advice you've ever got? Best advice I've ever got. Yeah. Oh my goodness me. Well, I'll tell you what, 
park that for a second and let me let, maybe this would be an easier one if you had an opportunity to speak to your younger self what advice would you give the young mark who's just coming out of school university yeah i would say continue continual development like just because you finished university doesn't mean um you know i i, I had a big break you know i thought i could work it out myself um but you know i think power of mastermind get yourself around people that are better than you and embrace self-development um i think you know and, and, a, and a strategy to do with continual learning interesting and have you had a, a chance does that trigger any thoughts on your bet the best advice anyone else gave you there's not one that really jumps out jumps out yeah well i guess it's it's just a, I, I, the, the advice that comes to mind, having heard your story today, and one that the listeners, I hope, can take away is that, you know, we all go through day, you know, points in our day when it's like, ah, you know, this is so stressful, or I'm so annoyed, or whatever it is, I, I've got such a stressful job and stuff. And unless they go through what you've gone through, nobody really has stress in the same sort of you know, get some perspective, you know, that the people in the people that are sheltering in Ukraine, like they have mm. real, real stress, you know, the, um, people like yourself who went through, you know, um, pretty severe prognosis and, uh, you know, they have real, you know, concern and, and the stress and, but, you know, people out there, I see kind of guys get, having road rage and stuff and losing their head over, you know, something sort of minor infraction and stuff. It's just, Get get a perspective on the reality of the situation and don't lose the don't lose the head. Try to con- keep control of your of your emotions. Yeah, and also allow those emotions sometimes. Like today, I I've, I've been in a funk. I had a coaching session to deliver at eleven o'clock, and so I put some music on in the kitchen at half past ten this morning, and I just tried to shake it out of my system because for some reason I was in a funk, and I was like, that's okay. Like I didn't try and rationalize with it, reason with it. I just tried to express it. And then I felt in a good energy when I got on the phone um, at 11, which was good. That's good. It's the most important thing. Well, Mark, um, thanks so much for coming on today. Uh, if, if anyone wanted to study, uh, you know, you and your message and, and the various things that you talk about, what's the best way, place to find you online? Yeah, I've got a website called terminaltotriathlon.com. Well, I'll link it up below. Yeah. Yeah. Terminaltotriathlon.com. And if you are inspired by my story and want to help me and other cancer patients, there's a GoFundMe campaign that links to it. So my current mission is to raise money to help um, cancer patients get access to um, functional medicine strategies and strategies not supported by mainstream medicine. So that's one part of the project. The other part of the project is to get the message out there and accelerate the change from a healthcare system that's reactive to more of a proactive healthcare system. Um, And so, yeah, and then I've got 50 podcasts that I plan to release this year and keep your eyes peeled for the book Terminal to Triathlon. Sounds good. All right, Mark, it's been a real pleasure. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you. I didn't mean to uh, go on for so long. (laughs) (laughs) Hey guys, it's me again. Quick favor before you go, if you could take a moment to just leave a quick review over on iTunes, or indeed, if you are watching this on YouTube, please just like it and leave a comment below. If you do have any questions or topics that you'd like me to cover in future episodes, leave a comment join the Facebook group. Alternatively, send me a DM uh, via social media. And as you guys know, my handle is Gavin J. Gallagher. And don't forget to check out that link to the Property Investor Readiness Test down in the show notes. Right, so guys, that's it. I hope you are going to have an awesome week and we shall catch you all next week.